We are continuing our series in Romans, and we are in the middle of Romans chapter 9. And so uh, if you have your Bibles, you can turn there. Uh, we, this is a uh, controversial a section of Scripture. Uh, it's often discussed and used and argued over. And so we'll just continue that tradition today, amen? Um, no, hopefully not. But uh, we ended last time in verse number 13. And if verse number 13 is the conclusion of his section where the Apostle Paul writing uses two examples from history, from Jewish history. He uses the example of Isaac and Ishmael and how God chose Isaac over Ishmael uh, to form the Jewish people, to be the, the blessed people. And then he uses the example of Jacob and Esau, uh, the sons of Isaac, and how God chose Jacob over Esau to be uh, to continue the, the line of the Jewish people. Esau became uh, his own nation known as Edom, but he was rejected by God. And so as we look at that and as Paul is writing, and again, uh, there, are, there are thoughts and controversies related to this. Some will say, well, this is uh, all of the people and the examples that are used are representative of nations. And so this isn't necessarily to individuals, but I think that that's probably short-sighted. Because the, the Bible is clear that, that God elects individuals. And then we look at these different passages, and as we do, and especially we come to verse 13, where it says, Jacob I have loved, and Esau I have hated, then immediately Paul goes into verse number 14. And, and what, he said, what he does throughout the letter to, uh, to the Romans is he anticipates questions and objections. Well, if you said that, then what about this? And that's exactly what he does here in verse 14. Because he says, what shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? Certainly not. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. I will have compassion on whomever I will have compassion. So then it is not of him who wills, nor of him who runs, nor of God who shows mercy. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, for this very purpose I have raised you up that I may show my power in you and that my name may be declared in all the earth. Therefore he has mercy on whom he wills and whom he wills he hardens. So when you read verse 13 that says God accepted uh, one brother and rejected the other, then the natural question might be, is God even a fair God? Is God a righteous God? And Paul puts it this way, is there unrighteousness with God? He immediately answers that and says, certainly not, but we need to understand that God is a holy and a righteous God. Now, I think it's, I, I think it's a good point for us to make here this morning that God is a God who has many attributes. But I believe, and I believe scripture backs up, that the overwhelming attribute of God is his holiness. Now God is a sovereign God. God is a loving God. He's a just God. He's a merciful God. He's a long-suffering God. He's an all-powerful God. He's an eternal God. He is all of these things. But he is first and foremost a holy God. We see this in Isaiah chapter 6 where the prophet Isaiah gets a vision of God. And if you remember that, there are these angels that fly about and they have six wings. And the Bible says that with two they cover their face, with two they cover their feet, and with two they fly. And they fly around the throne room of God and they cry out, holy, holy, Holy is the Lord God Almighty. They declare the holiness of God. In Revelation chapter 4, where John gets a vision 
of the throne room of God. He describes it and he describes the, the, the amazing stones that make up the foundation and the, uh, the throne. And, and he gives a description of these four beasts that fly around and they say, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. In both cases, uh, both John and Isaiah give a, a little bit different descriptions, but what they say is that th there's these beings that are declaring that God is holy. He's righteous. If he does it, it's right. And in him is no sin, no unrighteousness at all. And so... Paul asks the question, but he immediately answers it and says, this is not God being unfair. He says in verse 15, for he has said to Moses, I will have mercy on whomever I will have mercy and I will have compassion on whomever I will have compassion. Now, that phrase does kind of sound unfair to us. But it's interesting, that is a quote from Exodus chapter 33. And in Exodus chapter 33, Moses is communing with God. Matter of fact, it says in that chapter that he's speaking to him like a, like a friend. And through that conversation, right before God gives to Moses the tablets with the Ten Commandments on it, Moses asked to see God. And if you know that story, God says, all right, here's the way it's going to work. I'm going to put you in the cleft of a rock. I'm going to put you in a, in a crevice in a rock. I'm going to cover you with my hand, and I'm going to pass by. And then I'm going to remove my hand, and you can see my back, but if you see my face, you won't live. And I was thinking about that story in relationship to what we're studying about today. Because Moses saw the glory of God. That was his request to God. Let me see your glory. But he didn't see all of God. He never saw God's face. Because God said, if you did, you'd die. And yet, he got a glimpse of the glory of God. When we read this quote from Exodus 33 here in Romans chapter 9, and God says, I'm going to have mercy on whom I'm going to have mercy, and, and I'm not on people that I'm not, that seems unfair. But I would submit to you that we only get a glimpse of God. See, our God is a holy God. He's a righteous God. And let me just stop right there. We can't even understand that. We can say words that, that describe that. We can say, well, God is completely without sin. But I can't comprehend that because guess what? I am not completely without sin. I have, I have desires and impulses and, and thoughts all of the time that, that are not pure and righteous. And if I'm not careful, I act on those also in ways that are not pure and righteous. Matter of fact, sin is so entangled in me that it's difficult for me to imagine me without it in a lot of ways. I think about heaven and what the Bible says about it. And I think, you know, the Bible says we'll know each other. And I'm like, man, will I even know myself? And so we can describe God, but can we really understand who and what he is? God gives us glimpses of it. The other thing is this, and, and I've talked about this over and over, but we need to understand that we serve a big God. And he is beyond our complete comprehension. That's part of what makes him God. If you, if you know God and you think you've got him all figured out, then I would challenge you that maybe your God is not quite big enough. And so we get a glimpse of God here that God 
is righteous and he shows mercy and compassion on whom he chooses. Ephesians chapter 2 verses 8 and 9 says, For by grace you have been saved through faith and not that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. He goes on in verse number 17, or excuse me, in verse number 18 and says, Therefore he has mercy on whom he wills, and whomever he wills he hardens. I, that's the wrong verse. I apologize. Verse 16. So then it is not of him who wills, nor of him who runs, but of God who shows mercy. Now that's kind of weird, like cadence. Who wills and who runs? Like what does running have to do? If you have to run to please God, I'm in trouble. You know what I'm saying? Because listen, if you see me running, you should run too. Something's chasing me. You know how some people run for fun? I ran... I. I wanted to do a 5K with my daughter. So back at Thanksgiving last year, I did, we trained, I did a 5K. There was nothing fun about that. I'm just telling you. Like I didn't get to the end and I'm like, whoo, I just feel so good. I was like, I am so glad this is over. Where's the turkey? Like that. But this idea of running, it's, it's action is really what he's talking about here. He said, it's not of him who wills, who sets his mind to something, who decides to do something. It's not of him who runs, who who works. It's not anything that we can do. It is God's mercy to us. This is our relationship with God. This is our salvation. We don't do anything he does it for us. And then he talks about a reference to Pharaoh. For the scripture says to the Pharaoh, for this very purpose I have raised you up, that I may show you my, or that I may show my power in you and that my name may be declared in all the earth. Therefore he has mercy on whom he wills and whom he wills he hardens. He talks here about his purpose and he refers to the Pharaoh in Acts. uh, And and this quote is from Acts chapter, or excuse me, Exodus, Exodus chapter 9. Some 15 times in Exodus, it talks about the hardening of Pharaoh's heart. And sometimes the Bible says that Pharaoh hardened his heart that Pharaoh didn't want to hear what God had to say, that Pharaoh was resisting what God was trying to do. At other times, it says that God hardened Pharaoh's heart. And this is much debated amongst scholars and theologians as well. Some will say, well, God never hardened Pharaoh's heart until Pharaoh hardened Pharaoh's heart. But God did prophesy the hardening of Pharaoh's heart before Pharaoh hardened his heart. That's a lot of hearts to harden. How many hearts could I, I don't know. (laughs) So, again, I I don't want to tell you, I don't want to come up to you and, and preach this morning and you think this guy didn't study at all. But listen, I don't understand that. I don't know how God prophesied about Pharaoh's heart and how Pharaoh would react and how God reacts and the inner workings of that. I don't fully comprehend that because I am not God. And how God knew and raised up Pharaoh to to use him for his glory, that's a God thing. Not a me thing. But what we can do is trust God and understand what Scripture says about him. And what Scripture says about him right here we've already seen is, first of all, he's holy. He's righteous. And second of all, he's merciful. He shows mercy. Romans 9 goes on and says, you will say to me then, Paul anticipating how people will respond, he says, you will say to me then, why does he, talking about God, still find fault? For who has resisted his will? 
Paul said, listen, what you're going to say is, if God is doing this, if God is hardening Pharaoh's heart and showing mercy over here, then how can God really hold anybody responsible for the things that they did because nobody can resist God's will? But indeed, verse 20, O man, who are you to reply against God? Will the thing formed say to him who formed it, why have you made me like this? Does not the potter have power over the clay for the same lump to make one vessel for honor and another for dishonor? Now, it's interesting because in verse 14, Paul asked a question, and immediately he answered it. He said, is there unrighteousness with God? And he says, certainly not. And then he expands upon that. Now, here in verse number 19, he says, why does he still find fault for who has resisted his will? But he doesn't immediately answer that. I wish he did. Like, I wish he spelled it out as clearly as he did in verse 14. But that's not what he does. He says, that's not a question for us to ask. He says, does the pot, does the clay look to the potter and say, you're not doing this right, buddy. The the clay and the potter is, is a, an analogy that is throughout Scripture. It's in Isaiah, and in Isaiah 45 and verse 9, the New Living Translation puts it this way. What sorrow awaits those who argue with their creator? Does a clay pot argue with its maker? Does the clay dispute with the one who shapes it, saying, stop, you're doing it wrong? Does the pot exclaim, how clumsy can you be? Now, I am very, in a lot of ways, very stereotypically dad. Like, my daughter rolls her eyes at most of my jokes. I tell dad jokes. Um, All of the, like all of the phrases, the dad parenting phrases that, that, that are stereotypically used, I use all of those, you know? You think I'm talking just to hear myself talk? I say that one. You want me to give you something to cry about? I've said that. Some of you are like, really? (laughs) It's no picnic in my house, let me tell you. And so one of the things that I do is if something is purchased in my home and it needs to be assembled, 99% of the time, I'm the guy putting this thing together. I got the tools I've done it before, but I got to tell you, I I have matured because I now use the directions. That's it. Sure. Yeah, you know who started that clapping? My mother. And I'm going to tell you why, because there's an ongoing little conflict between my mother and I. I'm going to bring it right out. The Bible says, bring your faults to the church. Confess them one to another. The church discipline right now. No, that would be on me, I guess. When I, before I was married, my mom bought this brass and glass serving cart. And no need for it, but she wanted it. She got it. Right? Is that what it was? Is that what it was? All right. And it, had, it came with all the parts. You know, it comes in a box this big, but it's a thing like this big. You've got to put it all together. I'm forging the brass. Not really. <laughs> I don't want to go into all the details, but at one point I took out my drill, drilled holes, and screwed things together. That was not part of the instructions. And my mother always likes to give me a hard time for that. But I tell her, that cart never, it never even got loose. That thing was solid. She had it for years. I don't know where it is now, but it's not even broken down. I promise you. That thing is rock solid. But I did not put it together right. (laughs) For sure. You know, it's like, all you need is this Allen wrench. I've got a drill. It's probably good. Not only do I read the instructions, 
But typically, I'll read all the instructions, or at least glance at them, because sometimes they're kind of wordy. I like the ones with a lot of pictures. You know what I mean. Because I've learned so many stinking times, I start to put something together, and I see, oh, I see how this fits. And so I throw another piece on there, start to screw it together, and then you get two more spots, you know, two more steps ahead, and it's like, absolutely do not put this piece on now, and I'm taking it off. Because somebody designed that. And then they designed instructions on how it ought to be put together. And it's foolish for me to think I can figure it out all on my own and that I would go step by step perfectly along. It doesn't stop me from doing it, but it's foolish. And Paul says, are you the clay telling the potter how to work the wheel? Are, are you the one that, are, are you going to look to God? The, the one who by his very words spoke this universe into existence and say, hey, I'm not sure what you're doing here is really right. Think about, as a, if you're a follower of Jesus this morning, think about the absurdity of that. Because the Bible says that God created us, he formed us. Who gave us our sense of right and wrong? That comes from God. And then we're going to say, but, you know, I'm, I, I, I think maybe you're, you're off a little bit here. It's absurd. God is a holy God, and this we can trust. He says, does not the potter have power over the clay for the same lump to make one vessel for honor and another for dishonor? In my notes, as I wrote this out, I put this, I put mind your own business. Now, that might sound harsh, because you might think, well, usually we say that in a negative way. I don't necessarily mean it to be harsh, but I mean this. Our job is not to be God. The Bible over and over and over warns us that when we try to be God, when we try to put, to, to stand in the place of God, we're, it's going to be a mess, but God has given us things to do, things to worry about. That the image of the, of the potter and clay extends to the New Testament. And in 2 Timothy chapter 2, Paul also, writing to his protege in the ministry, says this in verse 20. But in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay. Some for honor and some for dishonor. Therefore, because of this, if anyone claims from the latter, he will be a vessel for honor, sanctified and useful for the master, prepared for every good work. You know what our job is? Our job is to strive to cleanse ourselves, to follow after God, to trust in him and obey him. And how God chooses to form us and use us is his business, not ours. Because he's God. And we are the clay. And so we ought to be about uh, trying to live according to godly precepts as best as we can. We ought to be about cleansing ourselves and trying to live a pure life. But not because we are God, not because we are innately holy and righteous as he is, but because we seek to follow after him. And then what he chooses to do with us, we need to be submissive to. And that can be tough. That's tough for me sometimes. Because I want to make plans and I want to do things and I want things to turn out just the way I want them to turn out. But ultimately, my job is, is to, to see what God is doing. 
to be submissive to him and what he desires for me. I am not the potter. I'm the clay. And then we want to look at the last section of Romans chapter 9, or at least the last section we'll look at this morning, where he says, what if God, wanting to show his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath prepared for destruction? And what he might made known the riches of his glory of the vessels of mercy, which he had prepared beforehand for glory, even us whom he called, not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles. Now, this is kind of a tough passage to understand, but look at verse 22 with me. He says, what if God? Paul's writing and he said, listen, God's a righteous God. And you might think it's unfair and you might not understand how God can hold people accountable, but we're the clay and he's the potter. And then he says this, what if God wanted to show his wrath and to make his power known, but he endured with much suffering, long suffering, the vessels of wrath prepared for destruction. He talks about God's enduring patience. Now, this is something that, that I don't always like that God does. And again, I'm not God, so it's okay. See, God's patience is great when it's directed towards me. When I don't immediately endure the consequences of my sin, when God gives me a chance for repentance and forgiveness, when, when, when God is patient with me, even though I make the same mistake a uh, second or 22nd time, I appreciate God's long suffering. But it's really annoying in others. You know what I mean? Like when somebody offends you, don't you want God to zap them just right then? Maybe that's just me. And when you see somebody make the same mistake again and again and again, and you're like, God, I've, I've had it, and God's still patient with them? But God is a long-suffering God. He's a patient God. He says... In 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 8 and 9, but beloved, do not forget this one thing, that, the, that, the Lord, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. Again, this is a part of God that we can describe, but it's pretty hard to really understand. God is an eternal being and he's not bound by time. We are. But he says, a day with the Lord is, is a thousand years, and it's a thousand years is one day. Well, so for God to extend his patience beyond what we could ever imagine is no big deal for him, but it's, it's mind-boggling for us. And then he says this in Second Peter, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God is not slack concerning his promise. God is a holy and a righteous God, so he's always going to do what he said he's going to do, even if it seems like it's taken forever. See, we don't have that much patience. If I tell my wife I'm going to do a, a task around the house and then that goes by for a day or a week or a month, you know what she eventually thinks? She eventually thinks I'm not going to do it. She's right. <laughs> but that's not what I say. I don't say to her I'm right. I say, baby, I'm going to get to it. I've just been so busy. But we forget. With me, that's a lot of times what happens. She'll go, hey, I thought you were going to, and I'm like, oh. Like you said that a month ago, and literally I haven't thought about it since, which doesn't give her a lot of warm fuzzies when I say that. <laughs> I 
But God doesn't forget. God doesn't forget his promises. God doesn't fail on his promises. We just think that because he's too patient. He's too long-suffering sometimes for our taste. But God is a patient God. And then he says this, and this is where I want us to kind of wrap up this morning. And that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy, which he has prepared beforehand from glory. Even us whom he called, not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles. Paul's writing to the church at Rome. It, it was in the beginning, predominantly Jewish. It had become now predominantly Gentiles, but the Jews had been allowed back into Rome. And so he's navigating through these chapters uh, about how the, the relationship between God through Jesus Christ among the Jewish people and the Gentiles. And then he sort of paints this picture in verse number 24. And he says, he called us not of the Jews only, but of the Gentiles. He, he fulfills, he is fulfilling his promise in the church. We read earlier Ephesians 2, 8, 9, where it says that we're saved not of works, but by God's grace alone. Otherwise, we'd brag about it. And then in verse number 10, he says this, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we would walk in in them. This is, this is what I think is so cool about the way God works. Even when we can't understand it. But I look around at Belmar Church and I think about the, the, the people that God has brought together. People who have great success in their careers and others who are struggling to figure out what to do for work. People who have great success monetarily and others who are struggling to get by. People with different educational backgrounds, racial backgrounds, some older folks, some younger folks. And, and it seems like there's no rhyme or reason. And yet God is working to bring a group of people together to accomplish his will. And in that, he shows himself mighty. In that, he, he is the one who gets the glory. And God does the same thing in our lives individually as we sometimes are, are frustrated in our lives and seems like we're just banging around in the dark and we don't know what to do. And yet God is working and he desires to be glorified. And so he says, I'm bringing Jews and Gentiles together. And right there in the capital of the Roman Empire, under Caesar that was Nero at the time, he says, God is showing himself. God is working. And God has a plan for you. God brought, has brought you to this time and this moment. And he has good works for you to do. He desires to be glorified through you. And you might not understand how he's worked. You might not, it might be promises that you felt like God made years ago that you thought he was never going to fulfill. But God is working in a mighty and a powerful way. And he is a God we can trust because he is a holy God. He does what he says he will do. I mentioned my father earlier, and God blessed me with a, with a godly father. Our relationship sometimes was as, as young boys and, and dads is in conflict when it, through some of my teenage years. But one of the things that I will, I will forever be grateful for my father is this. I could say, I could probably count on one hand the men that I've really gotten to know who I felt like operated with the utmost 
honesty and integrity in their life. And I can really think of no one who was more honest and and of higher character than my father. I appreciate that. He wasn't always right. He, He would make mistakes. But he would own those things. And if he said he was going to do something, for good or bad, it usually happened. I, I, I will tell the two or three times when maybe my dad changed his mind. Like when I would get in trouble when I was a little kid and I was going to get disciplined, he'd make me go sit on the bed. And I'd have to wait. I think usually for him to calm down. This happened frequently. I wasn't a real good kid. There was once or twice where I think he calmed down so much he just forgot. Like an hour later, you're peeking out. I think the coast is clear. Probably my most famous story about my father changing his mind was this. We, I, I was 16 years old. I had a curfew, and I don't remember what it was, but I know I came in after it. It was a Friday night. I came home late. My dad was there recognizing that I was not on time. We had a discussion about it. He seemed displeased. He took my car keys. Took my car keys, put them on the dresser. He said, you're grounded from your car. I don't remember exactly how long, but I think it was about a week. Saturday rolls around. I can't go anywhere. I can't drive anywhere. Sunday rolls around. Usually I would go with my buddies after church. We all went to church together. Monday morning rolls around. Now, I'm the oldest of three boys, and I would take my two brothers to school and drop them off. My father was a policeman, and he worked swing shifts, and that night he got home late. My mom got up, and she went to work, and my dad was still in bed. And I remember going to, uh, into his bedroom on Monday morning. He, he, he wasn't a morning guy anyway. He didn't wake up real bright and cheery. And I'm kind of shaking him. And I said, hey, are you going to take us to, to school? And I remember him looking at me and doing the math in his head. And he just kind of glared at me. And he said, your keys are on the table. And so I got out of it. He changed his mind. Normally he wouldn't. Man, I mean that in a good way. My dad, if he said he was going to do something for us, he did it. He'd make it happen. God is a God who doesn't change his mind. God is a God who always does what he said he would do. And you know what he said? He said that he loves us, that he's created good works for us. And he has a plan for you, and you can trust him. You can trust in him. Maybe you're here this morning, and you need to trust God for your very salvation. Maybe there's never been a time and a place in your life when you've asked God to forgive you for the wrong things you've done, and and you've trusted him to forgive you, to give you new and eternal life in him. Maybe you're here this morning and and you've just become frustrated in your walk with God and you felt like that God is not working and he's, he's not working in the timing that you want him to work and so you think he's not working at all. But this morning you need to be reminded that God is a God we can trust. The theme for this study through Romans is Romans chapter one and verse 17. The just shall live by faith. And so this morning, I just want to encourage you that God is a holy and a righteous God, and he will do what he said he will do. We can trust in him. Let's pray this morning. Our gracious God in heaven, Lord, we thank you so much for your love and your goodness to us. God, I pray that even this week as we are frustrated and, and, and sometimes as we pray and as we struggle and we don't feel you working like we would like to, God, I pray that you would remind us that you are a trustworthy God. 
Lord, if there's somebody here this morning that does not know you as Savior, God, I pray that we would have an opportunity today to talk to them about what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. Lord, help your word to find root in our hearts and remind us of your truth as we walk with you this week. In Christ Jesus' name we pray. Amen.